Hello and welcome back everybody. Um, I know that John and Rita made a lovely video for you and it's fairly long so I'm just going to add a few pieces. Um, I begged John and Rita to make that video. I really was begging Rita because um, I think she has a lot to add to the subject of uh, spirituality and forgiveness and also because I just miss seeing her and you got the bonus because I always think that a lesson um, or an interaction that you watch where John and Rita interact with one another, they just have so much to add um, to each other and so that it just makes it a little bit more meaningful. Um, and maybe we should have taken that into context. I think that would be true of, of any time you have people who know each other well and can bring in their own lives and own experiences into the class. Maybe we'll keep that in mind for future topics. Um, I am not going to be bringing my husband into the video, um, mainly because he would just make everything into a joke. So that won't be happening. <laughs> Uh, so just a few more add-ons. Hopefully this will be a relatively short video. So quick agenda. Again, thank you and shout out to John and Rita. Um, I want to go over just a little bit um, more forgiveness. There's a video I wanted to show um, and then some things to be thinking about in terms of um, concerns. Uh, and John and Rita may have brought up some of them, but um, there are a few that I wanted to talk about. And then I wanted us to talk just a little bit about restorative practices and how that relates to forgiveness. So forgiveness, keep in mind John and Rita's main tip, which is that you cannot force or assign someone to practice forgiveness. Obviously, we have given that as an opportunity for an assignment for you, um, and sometimes we do that with our groups of students, and as always, we allow them to pass and say either, I tried and I don't want to talk about it, or I decided I, I didn't have anything that I could um, try to forgive at that moment. Um, so while we can't try to force someone to practice forgiveness. We can educate you about the benefits and the process and how one might go about it. And John and Rita talked a lot about the process. Um, this is just something interesting that I always tell students when I introduce the practice to them. And I think it's easy to relate to because we all certainly have sort of done this ourselves, right? So um, a researcher studied the heart rate, blood pressure, facial muscles, facial muscle tension, and sweat gland activities while asking participants to ruminate on a negative interaction. And of course, it spikes all of those things. It makes uh, participants angry, anxious, and sad. Um, and then the participants were asked to imagine forgiving that person. Uh, and of course, all of those things decreased. Um, and so the video we're going to watch is a little bit of an example of that. Um, and then just this part I thought was interesting because I've used that. It comes from that study. They say that older people tend to forgive easier and that they're happier for it. And of course, I just recorded the lecture on um, different happiness factors and age being one of them that older people tend to be a little bit um, happier than younger people. And perhaps it's part of that time, um, the focus on time that we know that when some, you know, there's a finite ending for us coming and we think about that in terms of getting older and we don't live forever, um, that maybe it becomes less necessary to hold on to the grudges and easier then to forgive. It also may just come with practice, many more years of practicing to forgive um, because we have to do that with others and with ourselves every day. Um, perhaps as we get older, it just becomes a little bit easier and then that in turn increases our happiness. You are so cold to my friends and so incredibly rude. I uh, do have, I do have value. I need to forgive so then that I'm not bitter towards the next guy that comes around. Forgiveness. What does that even mean? Does it mean admitting you're wrong? Is it a sign of weakness? If you ask for it from somebody, do you lose the upper hand? How many times have you decided not to forgive somebody and maybe they didn't deserve it? What's the point? Why even bother, right? Hey, it's fine. It's none of my business. We don't have to get into them. Let's get selfish for a minute. What's in it for you? What would you say if I told you that psychologists have found a substantial correlation between reduced stress, better heart health, lowered anxiety, lower pain perception, and most importantly, higher overall happiness 
all attributed to your ability to be a forgiving person. Well, today we thought we'd dive in, check it out for ourselves. As usual, we brought in a selection of subjects, gave them all a test that gave us a fairly good idea at their current level of happiness. And as usual, they had no idea what we were doing. We started by asking them to close their eyes and picture somebody that they were currently holding a grudge against or had some sort of unresolved conflict with. Okay. You got that person in mind? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then we asked them to write out who this person was, what the event was that caused this tension between them, how they felt about it, and then most importantly, we asked them to, in their own words and in their own way, try and forgive that person. You had a bit to say, didn't you? A bit, yeah. Well, it, it's my sister. We uh, dated. It's kind of been in my head a lot, so getting it down on paper kind of gave me an image of uh, what I felt pretty much. Well, this particular person was my stage partner in a magic act that me and this person did together. Go on. <laughs> yeah, we never got to like hang out as often as I wished. Since you already have it all written out, do you think you'd be willing to share it with us? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was, uh, you know, a colleague at work. Oh, uh, there's one more, there's one more bit to this. Would you be willing to do it into a mirror? A uh, mirror. Yes. <laughs> Sure. I feel like we're work colleagues and we should have uh, a more of a common respect for each other. So we started trying to develop a different show together and as that started happening, everything started breaking down and we just would get into worse and worse fights. This person was a girlfriend I had a while back. Things escalated quick with us and uh, we enjoyed each other's company, but what I found out about her, I couldn't bring myself to forgive. I, w I would love to be valued at work. Appreciation, just a small, at the end of the day, thank you. You did a good job. This is a case of just knowing someone for a very long time and being just the one person that he always went to when things would go wrong. I found out that most of the stories she told me about her life were all lies. He just decided to um, up and essentially leave for, for four months and um, completely ruin any chances I had of starting another act. I'm not sure if she was uh, just trying to seem like an interesting person or just wanted some attention, but she already had mine. And I've tried to forgive you. I've tried to forgive you many times for acting this way. And it seems like when I do, you, it, I open myself up to getting just the door slammed in my face again. I am valid as a performer. <laughs> I do have I do have ideas and I do can create things and I have created things. In order for me to completely forgive you, I feel like I, I need to feel the respect that you give to everybody else on me as well. I don't feel that. However, now that I'm out in Los Angeles, thousands of miles away from home, I'm afraid. I'll never have as great of a chance to help you through life struggles. You never know who to trust, but he can, you can't, I can't put everything on him. But you know, when it did end, I was a little relieved because I didn't do it on my own for this whole seven years. We were doing this act for, for four years and I got really like, even though you know, like you can logically understand that you do have value, uh, in the world, if you want that from one particular person, this is gonna take a little while to let go of everything. And I know at times that I am a difficult person. Sometimes we try to, we wanna change people. I feel like it would be better if we could forgive each other and just kinda of start anew even with, when people make mistakes. I want you to know that I do care about you, that I'm always thinking about you. And if there's ever anything that you need from me, I'll be there for you. If you could just treat me just like you do, you know, your best friend at work, I think we'd be completely cool. I've had to keep a lot of stuff in, so it feels good to... <laughs> Having a grudge is, is uh, yeah. It's not fun and it's sometimes uh, Forgiveness just comes from within. You just learn to forgive and learn to move on.
Well, the results are in, and we found in our subjects an average increase in happiness of 8%, but the highest increase was 28%. Now, what does this mean about forgiveness? Most people think forgiveness is something that takes two people, a forgiver and a forgivee. But what we found today is reaping the benefits of forgiveness doesn't require anyone, except you. Now, it doesn't mean you have to reconcile with them or even say a word to them, because forgiveness doesn't mean excusing or forgetting what happened. Forgiveness is something you do for yourself to lower your psychological distress by getting rid of those negative emotions. So, is there anybody from your past that you're holding a grudge against? I've shown you the door. Now it's up to you to walk through it. I'm Julian, and this has been The Science of Happiness. So bad. Okay, how am I? See, I made it so big that I'm not going to be able to get out of this screen now. Hold on. Um, I, I was worried this would happen. I'm going to stop the share real quick. Um, I made the videos very big because John and Rita so cold made them very big and... No, oh, that's just walking me through the video, not okay. Um I can't even see anything anymore. Okay. Sorry. That was worse than usual. I'm gonna <laughs> it's probably gonna happen two more times because the video is taking up the whole page. <laughs> and I oh, we're just gonna keep going. Yeah, the shallow sound is shared. Okay, so um, again, I, I like those videos. I know they're kind of kitsch and, and cheesy. And I think that uh, sometimes it's hard to picture ourselves doing the activity, you know, doing the gratitude or doing the forgiveness. And that's why I really like those because they give you um, some actual participants to watch as they walk through that. Um, so I just want us to remember um, that there are a few things where what we are talking about might collide or not match up 100% with other things that you may feel or you may have heard. And so I just want to put that in here. So in the field of psychology and counseling, and as Julian in that video said, forgiveness is for us. It's not for the person who's done the harm. It does not necessitate a reconciliation, excuse me, um, or any kind of um, like interaction even with the person that you're trying to forgive. Um, but in a lot of other places and a lot of other areas of study, including some religions and some definitions of forgiveness, it absolutely implies absolution or pardoning. If you think about, um, you know, the idea of forgiving a debt um, that requires interaction in some way and and a in a absolution of something, um, and so. In the Christian world, I really liked this. I, I stole it entirely. And so um, you can read that whole article if you'd like. But um, in the Christian tradition, refusing to forgive is a sin. If we receive forgiveness from God, we must give it to others who hurt us. We cannot hold grudges or seek revenge. We are to trust God for justice and forgive the person who offended us. That does not mean that we must forget the offense. However, usually that's beyond our power. Forgiveness means releasing the other from blame and leaving the event in God's hands and moving on. And so we'll skip down to the bottom there. That can lead to a lot of troublesome things. Um, it can lead to essentially the idea that we forgive and forget and that Again, it says releasing the other from blame and leaving it up to God to determine punishment. Um, first of all, that's not how our current justice system works. And also it's a little dangerous if um, a person does something that's harmful and that could be, you know, continue to be harmful, not only to you or to others in the future. Um, and so I'll talk about a couple of instances of that in a minute. Um, the Jewish tradition of forgiveness requires action from both the person who did the wrong and the person who was wronged. The perpetrator must make amends, offer repentance. The person who was wronged is not obligated to forgive that person if they 
truly doubt the sincerity of the repentance. Um, and so this is sort of um, more along the lines of restorative justice that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but the idea is it, it's a collaborative effort between the person who did the harm and the person who was harmed coming together to understand one another. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that everything can be solved that way. It may be that that person cannot um, forgive if they don't uh, believe that the other person is truly either going to make a change or genuinely has some um, regret or remorse for their actions. Um, and the Buddhist tradition of um, forgiveness, and all these things are coming from, there's a link to a blog at the bottom, um, and it had a lot more information. So if you'd like to read that, I'm not going to assign it, but um, you could go ahead and read that whole thing. Um, this one was interesting to me because they say that some people get confused. Um, the Buddhist tradition doesn't really say anything in particular about forgiveness. Um, and there's actually a very antithetical notion about debts um, that anyone could be indebted to anyone else. And so it's kind of at odds um, with the idea of forgiveness in that way. But they do um, advocate for seeking inner peace and inner resolution about events by releasing anger, guilt, and shame. And so in that way, a lot of people interpret it to say that, you know, Buddhists by nature must be forgiving because we can't hold on to our anger and our, our shame if we are... Um, We'd have to forgive ourselves for things that we felt guilty about or for shame, or we would have to be forgiving of another person in order to not hold on to that anger. Um, so sort of back to that Christian idea of forgiveness, this what we would otherwise call toxic forgiveness is the forgive and forget mentality, which can give people who've committed a harm um, a free pass on their bad behavior. And that, again, could allow those behaviors to continue um, in a way that is dangerous. Um, and the, the article talked about us it leading to spiritual bypass where we focus on the moving forward because that's what that we're told to do. You have to forgive. If you read that, refusing to forgive is a sin. So if you can't get over it, that's your problem. And that may lead you to say that you've forgiven and move on when in reality you haven't actually processed the harm that was caused to you and you're just pushing it behind you so that you can be a good Christian, um, which we know is not good for us, right? Uh, and so some instances of this, uh, we actually had the pleasure in our multicultural class to bring in a professor here at the university, Tobin Shear. I didn't, I haven't seen uh, this uh, film women talking. I also haven't read the book, but he uh, mentioned it a little bit in the lecture that he gave because he does his research is uh, a lot on the Mennonite communities. Um, and it's about this group of Mennonite women who were, I believe, in Bolivia and horrific rapes that occurred in this community. Uh, they were essentially being uh, gassed with like veterinary products. And um, once it was found out that these people had done this, in their culture, it's very um, at the forefront that it's on you to forgive and that it's up to God what happens to that person. Um, and so in, in that particular film, I, I read a little bit about it earlier, the plot summary, it actually does sound like there was some um, criminal charges brought and sort of the point is when you're in the context of a culture and a system which says that you should just forgive and let God handle the punishment, that can often leave people feeling like they're at risk of that person doing that either again to them and or to somebody else. Um, and so just knowing that that is a thing that exists in a lot of religious communities, which can cause a lot of harm. Um, I also think I that link there for the Bob Jones University will take you to an article that I remember that stuck with me. I read it. It came out in 2014 about women who were assaulted at a particular university that's a Christian university who were pressured by their deans and by those in charge that they reported reported the assaults to that it was on them to forgive the person. And if they couldn't do that, like it was their fault that they were still experiencing anxiety and PTSD symptoms and stress about this assault that happened. And it was because they were not properly forgiving the person who had assaulted them, even though nothing was being done to those people um, and they were not being held responsible for their crimes. And so 
I think about that. I think about the um, Josh Duggar incident uh, or incidents, I should say, um, where, you know, he was assaulting his siblings and I believe they got him some Christian counseling, but, you know, didn't actually, it seems like work with the young ladies to figure out, you know, how they had been harmed and how they could prevent future harm, but also just this idea that we um, sort of, you know, God will deal with it later um, doesn't often make it safe for the people who have to to be around those people at the moment. Um, and then there's countless instances of um, reports of domestic violence, particularly in um, Christian uh, households that, you know, it gets reported to a minister or a pastor or a priest. And again, it's meant that, you know, they should come and they should repent to their, to God and that they will then be absolved and it's up to God to deal out punishments in the end. Right. And so lots of women being told by their religious community that they should stay in a situation and that the forgiveness is up to them. And if they can't do that, then that means that they're not a good Christian, in which case uh, they're worried about their absolution in the end and their salvation. Um, and so imagining the amount of anxiety and stress that that could put on a person um, is sort of distressing to me. And so just thinking about how those messages are out there and that we should be aware of them. Um, and so it brings me to my discussion questions or thoughts for your discussion post. What is your definition of forgiveness? Does it have reconciliation and a pardon necessary in there? Um, does it involve both parties? Um, you know, do, in order to forgive, must you process with the other person? Or is that something that you've traditionally been able to do on your own? Um, have you ever had an instance where your definition of forgiveness and someone else's are fundamentally different? Um, and again, thinking about that soul pancake video, is there a conflict that you have going on right now that you could try this out on, big or small? And again, I want to reiterate the warnings from John and Rita's video that um, forgiveness is often tied up in trauma. A lot of those things that I just talked about are kind of traumatic. Um, and so I just want to be clear that you do not have to engage in that kind of work if that is if you are not ready for that and not ready to process that. Um, and so think about it. And if it feels too tender, don't do it. Um, but if there's a small thing like the people in that video could bring up, um, thinking about what have you gained by holding the grudge and what have you lost? Um, and in particular, I'm thinking a lot about that in the last few weeks. Um, there's been some stuff going on in my personal and professional life that um, often, I, I think, when I think back to the lecture from last week that Dan did on communication, there's some things that I wish, and I told John this earlier, some things I wish I had read or, or listened to um, before I had this instance, um, where maybe I, my communication style and other communication styles are not matching. And so um, now we're sort of at this part where it feels like a harm has been caused and I'm not sure if we're at a place where we can can get past it I hope we can and I can think about the danger of holding that grudge and what it's doing to my relationships and the things that maybe I could gain if I was able to um, sort of practice the forgiveness and climb into the other person's mind and think you know well I'm sure that what you meant isn't actually what I heard when I was in that emotionally charged state. Um, and maybe then I said or did some things that that made that difficult on the other end. And now we're at this place where it feels like um, we're still having some trouble. And so I'm, I'm thinking a lot about what I have lost primarily over this instance. Um, and so again, if it is not going to work for you, do not feel like you have to, to put all of that into your discussion post. So um, take the easy way out. Either don't, don't discuss this stuff if it's, if it's too tender, or um, again, maybe the definition of forgiveness is a more general question. You can answer one of those instead. All right, so to restorative practices, uh, restorative justice has its roots in tribal and indigenous communities. I watched a video that I almost considered having you watch, um, and actually it, it kind of traces back the history of how 
when we were in small groups of people living in villages, it was much more important to have a practice that could work for everybody, right? So we live in these very large societies now where we don't have necessary interactions with every person in our town. And so it's possible that someone could do harm to you and you would say, well, just, you know, put them in jail. And that is a solution that, that currently works in this system. But back in the day when we lived in tiny villages, um, that was not an option. You, we didn't, as a as a people, as a society, just cast people out when wrongs were done. We tried to figure out what had happened and tried to figure out what the person who'd been harmed would want and what the person who'd done the harm could do to sort of come back together and bring that person back into the community. Um, and so these these practices sort of went away as our societies got bigger. And in some places, uh, particularly here in our tribal communities, that is still very much the system of justice. So the basics, basic distinction is retribution, which is what I would say our criminal justice system has, says you've broken the rules and until you pay us back by being punished, you're not welcome in the community. And again, as we know, even when people do pay their debt to society, um, we still often hold grudges and feel as if that person is still dangerous or bad, no matter what they have done to repent or to repair. Um, and often we don't give them a lot of chance to repair because the system isn't designed that way. The system isn't designed for them to, to make amends. And so um, we just send them away. Res restoration practice says you're one of our own and we're not gonna give up on you. However, the thing that you've done, the behavior is unacceptable because it harms all of us, including you, and we'll hold you accountable while you repair the harm and restore the community fabric. Um, and I liked this part here. It's uh, restorative practices cultivate the conditions for the happiest possible ending given the situation and the people involved. So it's not this idea that, you know, we just come back together and bring a person back in. It's that we work together to find something, some solution that will work for the person who's been harmed and that the person who's done the harm can acknowledge that and sort of come away from the solution with the best possible outcome. Um, and some of that is adapted. There's a link down to the bottom. It actually takes you to a PowerPoint that has some of that, including what's on the next slide, um, which these are kind of no brainers and something that maybe we don't think about as much, but offenders often punishment doesn't work, right? That's sort of a miss, you know, we, we punish people because we feel like it's going to um, prevent them from doing that harm again. Um, and for some people, maybe some punishments do work. And for others, it's not working. Often because the offenders see the punishment as a passive experience, they're not participating in it. They often don't have a voice. Um, I mean, especially if you think about our criminal justice system as it is, um, sort of, it, it's a, it gives you an all or nothing. You either plead guilty or you plead not guilty. And if you plead not guilty, you don't get the opportunity to even acknowledge the harm that you've done because your lawyer, of course, is telling you to sit down and shut up um, and to just be wait for the, the jury, if that's what you're doing as a jury trial, to render a verdict. Often it's, you know, it's way less common for you to actually even speak in your own defense because often uh, it makes it worse. And so if your um, lawyer says, no, you don't even get to stand up and speak, you're very passive in that. Um, scenario. External awards and punishments um, cause offenders not to develop internal controls. And I think about that in the context of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. So if I, you know, if I don't have any control over the external reward or punishment, then I'm not going to be motivated intrinsically to do better. I'm just going to hope I avoid the punishment. Um, Offenders often resent the authority figures for imposing the punishment, and then that sort of creates a whole different system of holding a grudge against a different entity, not necessarily the person that they've harmed or the, the thing that they've harmed, but against the system. Um, and so it, it's not going to make them necessarily 
be more thoughtful about what they did. They're just going to be angry and holding their own grudge. Um, offenders are alienated from the victims and the community and the authorities. Um, and you know, we think back to what we learned about how community helps shape our happiness, how social connections shape our happiness. Um, and you know, when we push people out to the margins, that doesn't give them a lot of opportunity to connect with others and um, to improve themselves and to be happier, right? And so there are lots of effects of unhappiness. And given the other contexts of our criminal justice system, it often means that they end up not being as, as willing or able to rejoin the community because we still hold them at arm's length. If you're a felon, you don't get to be able to work certain places. Um, and so it's harder for them to rejoin, in which case maybe they continue to, to commit harms. Um, the victim and the community have no say in how to restore social respect and safety. And this one, I kind of, it's been sticking with me. There's a podcast if you'd like to listen to it, and you certainly don't. And trigger warning, it is about a sexual assault of a child. Um, a pretty well-known case, if you're familiar with uh, the film director Roman Polanski, his victim in the years since she's uh, an adult woman that happened back in, oh, I can't remember, it's probably the 70s, maybe the 60s even. She's, you know, an adult woman now. And for decades, because of course, Roman Polanski fled the United States um, when he was accused of these crimes. Um, and so the case just dragged on and on and on. And, uh, I, you know, if, a few years ago, it sort of came out that she wanted them to just drop. She wanted the courts to drop this case, right? It's It was more harmful to her um, to keep reliving it over and over and over again. And she had come to a position where she could forgive this person for what they had done to her. And the court said no, um, because that's not how our justice system worked, um, which is quite remarkable when you think about it. If um, you kind of have this idea that um, the justice system is supposed to work for victims, but the victims don't get to say whether they want to continue with something or not. Um, the state gets to decide that. Um, and then, so in some ways that can be helpful, but in, in lots of ways, it means that, you know, a family, for example, who wanted to forgive a person a drunk driver who killed their family member, um, they can make a statement to the judge about what they'd like for that person. And that judge does not have to take it into account at all. If that judge decides that they want to put that person in jail and not allow them to do, you know, rehabilitation or anything like that, that's what happens in the criminal justice system. Um, and so it, it's, it's not, it's not bringing a lot for victims either in this scenario. Um, because of all of the shame and the, the blame around people who do harm, families and friends of those who do harm become alienated from others. Um, and then they're kind of pushed out onto the margins. And again, what does that do for our communities? Often family members will either have to decide to stick by their loved one and defend them, or they'll be forced to kind of push them away and throw them under the bus. And we know that that's not great for our mental health and for our happiness um, to feel like we don't have a choice and to feel like um, we have to turn our back on somebody that we love um, because of something they've done. Uh, we know, again, research doesn't support the effectiveness of punishment in stopping uh, rude or challenging behavior. Um, it's, you know, one of the primary arguments against the death penalty is the argument for it, everybody says, is, well, it'll prevent people from doing horrible crimes. And in reality, it doesn't. The implementation of the death penalty has not significantly changed who commits what crime. You know, states that had it for a while and states that didn't have it, they weren't having any more or less, um, you know, ho horrible crimes that that would have been a punishment that could have been used. And so we know that it doesn't work. Um, and then, of course, the last one, the wider community doesn't get involved in any kind of long-term prevention plan. Um, and it's hard to come up with a prevention plan if we don't know what an offender 
was thinking to begin with, um, because we don't really give them an opportunity to speak. And we don't really hear what was going on for them often. And so how could we decide how to prevent a thing if we never really talk to the person uh, and learn about the motives of the harm? Just one last piece. I, I don't know, the more I think about this, the more it kind of just reminds me of like, this idea in general that our society has, which is that you're never supposed to um, take responsibility or be held accountable. And, and I don't know if that's a related to this idea of just like being sued, for example, but I can think of, um, you know, an instance in my own life where I rear-ended a person in front of me. And, you know, obviously the person that I hit is going to be very upset a bad thing happened to them. And I could just tell when we got out of our cars immediately, because I was genuinely sorry, and it was genuinely my fault. I said, Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. It's totally my fault. You know, I'm getting ready to give them my insurance information. I could see the difference in the way that that person interacted with me simply because I took accountability for what had just happened. And I had apologized. And it seems so silly because of course I apologized because I, I did something that harmed them and it's rare that people do that. Um, I often think, and again, trigger warning, if you're, um, not, this is, a uh, the pretty well-known story about the, um, rape that occurred at Stanford's campus um, a few years back. The young lady has written a book now. Uh, her name is Chanel Miller and, I think she talked in her memoir a lot about how it just would have gone a lot a long way to have heard her perpetrator acknowledge that harm had been caused and that he had been the one that caused it. And again, like I said, our criminal justice system doesn't work that way. It's possible that, you know, he may feel guilt and he may feel remorse. And when you're accused of a crime, your whole goal in our criminal justice system is to prove that you didn't do it or that you shouldn't be held accountable for it. And again, for those people, I think about whether a restorative practice might have made all the difference um, in terms of feeling like something had been taken care of. All right, I'm going to play this and then we're going to have the whole problem where you, <laughs> I have to pause the screen. So again, those are restorative practices in general, and this is in particular how we can implement restorative practices in schools, which is relevant to all of you as educators. Restorative practices is one of the most widely used school climate initiatives in the world because it not only improves school culture and equity, but because it offers a more effective way of addressing discipline problems. So what is restorative practices exactly? So what is restorative practices in schools? Restorative practices are a set of skills for building community and for responding to challenging behavior. Research shows that restorative practices not only reduces out-of-school suspensions, it increases school climate, strengthens relationship, and significantly improves equity in the discipline of schools, becoming an effective tool for inclusion. Restorative practices are really structured conversations. They fall on a continuum ranging from low intensity, less planning, classroom-based strategies, all the way to higher intensity, more structured, office-managed strategies. It's helpful to integrate restorative strategies into a multi-tiered system of support so that these practices become part of the universal, targeted, and intensive interventions at a school. In Tier 1, you have the proactive components of restorative practices, classroom circles and affective language. Classroom circles, also called community circles, strengthen relationships within the classroom and then they address common classroom issues. We take turns, listen deeply, and we don't interrupt, cultivating trust and promoting equity. Once circles are a part of the classroom culture, they can be used to address difficult topics like bullying, race, or traumatic community events. In Tier 1, we also use affective statements to model how to express feelings and restorative questions to talk to students about their behavior. When you proactively establish a system of using circles in classrooms and consistently use affective language in everyday conversations, 
you have a solid foundation when responding to more serious incidents in tiers two and three. In tier two, we have more structured conversations like restorative chats, restorative mediation, and restorative circles, which usually take place outside of the classroom by another staff member. Instead of delivering punishments, judging and scolding, we support the student to accept responsibility, to be accountable, and to make things right. A restorative chat is a short, informal conversation with a student regarding their behavior. The staff member uses the restorative questions to help the student reflect on their behavior, reintegrate them back into the classroom, and repair that relationship with the teacher. Restorative mediation helps resolve conflict and arguments between two students. Students have the opportunity to express how they've been affected by what happened, think about their actions and how it might have impacted others, and then make agreements together on how to move forward without the continued conflict. Restorative circles, also called harm circles, are in response to more serious incidents at school, and they bring together the people impacted by the incident. This requires pre-meetings so that participants understand what questions will be asked and then they agree to follow the guidelines. In a circle, the facilitator guides the participants to talk about what happened, who was affected, and how we can repair the harm. And in Tier 3, we have restorative conferences to respond to significantly disruptive or harmful incidents at school. And they're even more structured than circles, specific seating arrangements needed, and a script for the facilitator to follow. Conferences include those who did the harm and those who were harmed, as well as other people that were impacted. So while schools who implement restorative practices tend to have very few out-of-school suspensions, when it does happen, we use re-entry circles when the student returns so that we can make a plan of support for them and their families. Restorative practices give schools explicit proactive structures to develop relationships, strengthen inclusion, and to build a culture of empathy and compassion. Then, when incidents of harm occur, restorative practices provides meaningful responses so that we can address the behavior, resolve the conflict, repair relationships, and heal. For more on how to implement restorative practices at your school, go to lauramoyman.com and download free resources watch free training videos, and check out my online courses. If you're new here, make sure to give me a thumbs up. Okay, we're going to try to stop the share. And then open. Okay. This is like the one time I'm really wishing that I had um, two screens, but I don't. All right, so yeah, I, a lot of you may be really familiar with restorative practices and others, maybe this is a, a new thing for you. Um, and so I'm just curious in the discussion, maybe does your school use restorative practices? Tell us a little bit about whether that's implemented like the MTSS model that um, the person in the video talked about. Um, if so, are there limits to what it's used for, right? So I know there's certainly small things that may might be more easily addressed with restorative practices. And then there are maybe those things that linger from um, the past model of a zero tolerance policy. And so are there certain things that you can't use that for? If you do use them, how have you seen them work or not work? Um, if you don't use them now, could you conceive of a way to put them into effect? Um, and that might be, you know, can we do it just in my classroom because that's all I can control and my administrator doesn't support this for whatever reason? Or is there a way to incorporate it into the larger community and school? Or is it already working that way? Um, I can think of, uh, I was a long-term sub back in, in 2014 at an elementary school, and I had an incident with a little girl who, you know, she had like a full meltdown in the classroom. She was throwing chairs. She was having a whole rough life. I think she was a first grader, and the entire classroom left, obviously, because she was sort of, you know, a danger at that point to others, and the teacher took everybody else out. And I'm thinking back now that I don't think we did um, any kind of a, a restoration for the harm that was caused. Um, 
And that sort of robbed her of the ability to reconcile what her actions, the impact her actions had had on her classmates. And it also then left her classmates in a place where they were sort of afraid of her and didn't understand why she had done that. Um, and so I just, I think back now to wishing I had known more about restorative practice at the time um, so that I could have worked with that teacher and the administrator to sort of bring that into the classroom and, and help those students um, to come back together as a community. Because after all, that's what we are in a school and especially in our classrooms. Some reminders, um, your advocacy journals, I sent an email. I'm so sorry that we have not been doing a good job of reminding you of this. We said journal every week. You can journal every few days. We have had class, you know, every day of the week. And so uh, every few days is fine too. Um, the final assignment is not due until the 18th of August. And so if you haven't been doing it, don't panic. You can still do it over the next month. Um, quiz three is due on July 28th. Uh, your lesson plans, if you're doing them, are due with those due dates there. Um, and again, remember, we're flexible on due dates, but the, that was the idea. Um, and then extra credit, John had sent out an email about um, if you, some people maybe didn't want to do as many lesson plans, or you wanted to do more um, of the active learning assignments, um, you can look back at John's email, read that. And if whatever you are thinking about doing is not on that email, please email us and let us know. Um, and then just a note, I did send an email, but in case you didn't see the email, your points, we changed the grading uh, settings so that you'll just see points now. That is not your percentage. Um, and we hope that that would reduce some of your anxiety as you see yourself moving towards the required number of points, which is 283 out of the total 405, um, that you might have a little less anxiety when you don't do as well on something. Uh, the quizzes mainly seem to be <laughs> the issue because you're all doing great on the discussion boards and uh, in your assignments. Um, and so just know that that's not your percentage. That is the number of points you have. We, of course, want you to continue doing all of the stuff through the end of the class that you are able to do, including those uh, post-tests. That one is, is pretty important for us so that we can see um, how things were going at the beginning and how things were going at the end. Um, but once you hit the 283 points, points, that's when you can sort of breathe easy and know that um, you've done what you needed to do to get credit. And of course, if you want to keep doing other stuff, you are more than welcome to do that. Uh, I think, oh, I have a video. Sorry, one more video. And it is about restorative practices. So it is a little bit educational and a little bit song related. And it just felt like the right way to end it. Uh, and I hope you all have a lovely day. Stick with me for the video. Um, maybe this time because it, it talks a little bit about restorative practices. Otherwise, it's not just a, a regular song. In order to heal our ancestors, we have to dream our future. So I think the next thing we want to do is like make some like future building art together. So um, we're going to be thinking about this future uh, in more detail. If uh, you like to draw, then draw something. If you want to write some bars, write some bars. Uh, but it's going to be an art activity, like a visual art activity. All right, so we're going to pull out these things um, and just vibe. Yeah? Yeah. Yes. First things first, I show up, ready to be in circle. Here to actively listen and be openly verbal. This type of cipher that serves like a meal. We're here to solve problems and hopefully heal. I start by telling the group a little bit about me. I want to get to know you, curiosity is mounting. We're here to build trust so we can speak facts. A heartfelt response for the best impact, see? The circle is a space to grow, connecting us to a collective glow. Candles get lit, reflect the light. Together to hear every person's side of the story. 
So you're up next. <sighs> All right. Past the object, it's my turn to speak. To share what's on my heart and the truth we seek. I hope they understand where I'm coming from. What harm was caused, what can be done. We can't move forward till we take the pause. Examine all the hurt we might have caused. When it's your turn, can't promise I'll agree. But maybe there's perspective that I did not see. The circle is a space to grow. Connecting us to a collective glow. Candles get lit, reflect the light. Illuminating how we're here to do right. Where are we left without respect? A little bit of honesty. That restorative justice. Where are we left without healing? A little bit of empathy. That restorative justice. Where are we left without love? Other out, we're owning up to our hearts. Healing doesn't end here. This is a start. How we hold this defines us as we leave and take care. We're in this together like our ancestors' prayer. We're leaving here today with community tactics. And Arja is a constant and continuous practice. We restore fairness. We make peace. We are community. Find the relief. The circle is a space to grow. Connecting us to a collective glow. Candles get lit. Reflect the light. Illuminating how we're here to do right. Take a second breath, here we go. Now close your eyes and we're gonna clap together. No count, here we go. All right, see you next time. Where's my record? <laughs>